Welcome back to the AD security track. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Next up, we have Doug and Austin, who will give a talk on how you can compromise ADFS in Active Directory and what you can do with that as an attacker. The stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our talk. I am ADFS, and so can you. Rebecoming the greatest identity provider we never weren't. So, what, can everyone hear me? Is this close enough? I think. Yeah? Um, so, what are we looking to cover today? Uh, we'll start by talking about who we are, um, so you know all about that. Um, we're going to talk about ADFS, how ADFS actually works. It's a bit of a complex system. How can we actually find ADFS servers in a target environment? How do we attack ADFS? Um, then the focus of the talk, really, how do we actually become, how do we take over an ADFS server? Um, we'll talk about some tools and demos that actually allow us to do these attacks. And then, of course, uh, us being incident responders, we're going to want to talk about best practices and mitigations. So by the end of the talk, we hope that you have a solid understanding of ADFS, uh, how we can attack ADFS, um, why it's actually an important target for us to attack, and of course, how to keep it safe. Uh, so my name is Doug Beanstock. I'm a principal consultant at uh, Mandiant, where I am an incident response as well as a red team lead. I've been with the company for about four and a half years now. My past year, my research has focused on organizations and their move to the cloud. So I've done some other talks about Office 365, about multi-factor authentication. Um, that's really been my research as of late. And I am Austin Baker, uh, similar to Doug. I do both incident response slash security research, and then I moonlight as a red teamer every now and then. I've been at Mandiant for five and a half years. Um, part of my responsibility is I get to teach some classes like enterprise incident response, and I enjoy that. Uh, and I also enjoy playing games in junk. Okay, so what actually is ADFS? Anyone who reads a lot of Microsoft documentation knows that Microsoft loves to have confusing acronyms that we get to remember. So we need to understand what all these acronyms mean and how they play together. So at its core, Active Directory Federated Services, or ADFS, can be thought of as a single sign-on solution that allows users in an organization to access resources in another organization. Even simpler, if I'm an organization, I want to give my users the ability to use their corporate on-premise credentials to access applications and resources that are not stored in my own network. It's a central management place for authentication, identity management, and token issuance. So why do we actually care about ADFS? Organizations are moving more and more of their assets, more and more of their computing power into the cloud. And AD can no longer really be thought of as a security or as a data boundary, right? How many people use Office 365 as their email platform? A lot of hands. Fewer, fewer here than in the States, which is interesting. But still, many people use the cloud. Um, ADFS, usually in a large organization, is the gateway to the cloud for users. So um, our parent company, FireEye, we use ADFS. A lot of the organizations that we do red teams for, they have ADFS as well. And it's an important target for us because if we can own ADFS, if we can become ADFS, we now own the cloud. And as security practitioners, we need to keep up with this move to the cloud because attackers are moving there as well. So we need to be able to understand what this means. Right, and, and one additional thing is that, um, as anyone who does pen testing knows, it's not simply a can you get domain admin, it's what you can actually do with it. So as more of those valuable resources move out of the actual organization into the cloud, we as attackers have to keep motivating security changes by demonstrating that we can still access those exploiting security flaws that still exist today. So now we're going to enter a, a whirlwind tour of ADFS. Um, in about 10 minutes, you're going to become ADFS experts. So the uh, building blocks of ADFS are claims. Claims are the currency in Active Directory Federated Services. They are just statements about a user, things like a user's account name, a user's email address. This is what ADFS lives on. And these claims are going to come from an attribute store. In 99% of cases, your attribute store is just going to be Active Directory. And then claims are operated on with rules. And they're just business logic that can take a claim, apply some sort of condition, and then output a new claim. And it's important for us because we need to know what these claims are so that we can understand what the security tokens uh, are going to look like. We have an example claim here. Our condition is in red. We're looking for a claim of the type Windows account name, so just an authenticated user. And then our statement is in blue. So we're actually going to query Active Directory, and we're going to look up the user's uh, mail attribute. And then we're going to issue that as a claim of this nice long type uh, of email address. 
All right, so talking about claims in order to understand how those are handled, we have to look at the pipeline. Um, so for example, you're going to get a claim from Active Directory, so it hits stage one. ADFS has to determine if the claim meets the desired format and expectation from that source. After it's determined that this actually meets that requirement and is going to be processed, it goes to stage two. This is where we apply the authorization rules. We check to see that the entity described in the claim is actually authorized to access whatever object is being discussed. After that authorization is either confirmed or denied, then it gets passed to the issuance step where we take the claim, we transform it in a particular way, and pass it on to the relying party. And why this is important is because that final step, we, we really as attackers only care about the final step, the issuance rules, what comes out of our pipeline. And this is because these claims that come out of the pipeline are used in our uh, security tokens. And these security tokens are what our relying party, so I'm going to use Office 365 throughout this talk, it's what Office 365 actually expects to see in a security token so it can make its authorization decisions. And ADFS speaks two different types of security token. Depending on your relying party, it's either going to issue SAML 1.1 or SAML 2.0 tokens. And again, as attackers and as developers, the nice thing about SAML tokens is that they're standardized, right? There's the whole OASIS body that standardizes what these tokens needs to look like. As developers, that's good because we can now program any sort of application to federate with ADFS. As attackers, that means we have a basis to form templates. We have a basis for our attack. And how these tokens are actually transmitted between the two parties is also standardized. So uh, SAML consumers, they're generally going to take it as a post parameter, uh, and that post parameter is SAML response. So we already sort of have an idea of how we might be able to become an ADFS server. So I mentioned that claim rules are very important for us as attackers because they help us understand what these security tokens are going to look like. So at the end of the day, ADFS is going to take a claim, and it's going to translate it into an attribute. In SAML talk, this is also called an assertion, so a statement about a user. Um, so we can see that we have a SAML assertion. The type is email address. It's coming from our issuance rule. And the value in this case is uh, the user's email address. So my test lab is docorp.com. So the user's email address is there, robin at docorp.com. OK, we're almost done. ADFS is called the identity provider. If you've ever worked with OAuth before and that sign-in flow, it's the same concepts. Uh, Active Directory and the ADFS service together, they work to verify an identity, so authenticating a user's credentials. They build up claims about the users through that pipeline we talked about. And finally, they issue a security token. The receiving end of that is going to be our relying parties. So that's any sort of uh, federated application. Generally, these are cloud-based apps. They receive a security token, they verify it's valid, they unpack the claims, and using those claims, they decide if this user can access it and how they can access it. And so examples of some relying parties, Office 365, Dropbox, Slack, AWS, Zendesk, Bombgar, these are all relying parties that I've seen clients use with ADFS uh, on red teams that I've done, and they're all relying parties that have compromised through ADFS attacks. Right, and uh, when we're talking about the scope of the problem, these are all integral parts of so many organizations. If your organization uses Active Directory and is trying to synchronize that somewhere, odds are it falls on Active Directory federated services to do that work. So tying it all together in a nice little flow, um, we've got our user in the DoCorp domain. He wants to access his Office 365 email. So he navigates in his browser to portal.office.com. And he types in his email address at docorp.com. Office 365 is going to check that domain to see if it's federated. If it is, it's going to return with a 302 redirect to our ADFS server's public DNS name, sts.docorp.com. We're going to be talking to a web application proxy. Um, we don't want our ADFS server to be exposed <coughs> to the internet because it contains some very important cryptographic material. So we have a proxy, and it's basically just a dumb reverse proxy. Uh, and we get our web-based authentication page. The user types in their username and password. And ADFS receives that username, that password. It talks to Active Directory to actually authenticate the user. And then ADFS receives some claims about the user and goes through that claims pipeline we talked about. Eventually, it's going to issue this security token, which I have a really dumbed down version of here. It's just an XML document. The, the important part about this is uh, the SAML token, how the relying party actually verifies that this token was issued by Active Directory, that the user is who they say that they are is a digital signature. So the ADFS server has what's called a signing certificate. It's a private key and public key pair. 
it's going to sign the SAML token using a standard, again, it's using XML DSIG, which is a standard uh, for signing XML documents. And then it's going to send that signed token onto the end user. That user is going to then go ahead and provide their signed token back to Office 365's consumer endpoint. Office 365 verifies the digital signature in the SAML token. It then unpacks what are called the assertions now, those claims. And if the user is, if the signature is valid and everything else adds up, it's going to return to the user an authorization cookie so that they can actually access Office 365. Right, and for those of you who are still awake in the audience, uh, what's one step that we would expect to see in any generally secure organization as part of this process that is missing from this chain? MFA. MFA, ta-da. MFA, uh, now, MFA integrates directly with Active Directory Federated Services in the form of an identity provider adapter. Any additional layer of security that you're going to install from a vendor is going to be installed directly on your ADFS server in the form of these adapters. So we have to talk about them because it turns out they're pretty important. Um, why do we need adapters? Well, because we need a key point of integration to add uh, extensible third-party support for additional kinds of authentication, including ones that we haven't conceived of yet, right? Um, in the list of supported schema claims, uh, there's actually one for biometric authentication via voice analysis. So things that haven't generally been deployed in the field yet still have to be accounted for in the form of this adapter interface. Um, so ADFS is the nexus of all of this uh, identity provision. So all of the vendors have to provide some sort of integration point, um, which turns out to be a pretty interesting point of focus. Um, that said, So we're all ADFS experts now, right? Um, so we can actually move on to attacking ADFS. The first step is actually finding them in an organization. Um, so one of the best ways is to use just your, whatever your preferred OSINT provider is to search for the subdomains that Microsoft recommends you use. Most people follow Microsoft's advice. So we can search for uh, ADFS, STS, FS. And a quick Shodan search I did last week found over 10,000 instances of ADFS servers or their proxies exposed to the internet. Really simple way to see if your target organization is using ADFS. If they have Office 365, chances are they're federating their domains, they're federating that Office 365. So you can try logging in with a bogus email address. It doesn't even need to exist, it just needs to be the domain. If that domain is federated, you're gonna get redirected to the ADFS server. And because there was no actual authentication interaction, there's not gonna be any logs for the blue team to look at to know that you've just been enumerating whether or not they actually use ADFS. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of required URL paths and ports that need to be exposed to the internet that you could search on to see is my target organization using ADFS. Turns out there's some fun things that come out of the uh, required and recommended features of an ADFS proxy. So when you're deploying ADFS, we've just realized that it's very complex. You all are experts from the past 10 minutes. Um, one of the things Microsoft recommends you do is initiate this feature called IDP initiated sign-on. Now it's a legacy feature that you really don't need, but what it provides for us as attackers is at this really lovely URL, we have a nice forms-based authentication page that we can use to conduct a password spray. So we don't actually have to go through an authentication flow that we outlined earlier. We just navigate to this page and we can start our password spray. Also, if this organization is federating any SAML applications, so Dropbox, for example, Zendesk, this page is also gonna provide a nice list of them. So as attackers, this is a nice little piece of information we can use maybe to form a good social engineering scenario. We at least know, you know, if my flag is to actually access, uh, let's say, Bomgar, I know, and now know that I need to attack ADFS in order to do so. The second sort of fun thing is that ADFS supports NTLM-based authentication. Now this makes sense if we're on-prem. We want our users to be able to seamlessly authenticate to ADFS using NTLM, sure. But by default, these URLs are also exposed to the internet via the ADFS proxy. And in general, as security practitioners, we know it's a bad idea to expose NTLM authentication to the internet. One of the main reasons is that it's going to leak information about your internal network to these internet-bound users. So if you go through a bogus challenge response, the server is going to respond with a base64 encoded string, and in that string you're going to get the fully qualified host name of the ADFS server. So for targeting purposes, it's not the proxy, it's the actual ADFS server, which we'll need to target later on in our attack. 
And we also have the FQDN of the Active Directory domain name, helpful for other sorts of attacks. Um, and it also is just a nice little interface or two interfaces for us to conduct password spray attacks as well. OK, so um, now that we know what ADFS is, we have a really uh, set of different methods that we can use to quickly identify it. Let's talk about attacking it. Um, so of course, the immutable rule of security is that the more complex systems become, the more attack surface gets exposed and the more mistakes uh, or design decisions start to impact the overall security of the item. So we begin first, of course, by targeting the weak links. So dividing it up into three core areas that we can attack. First and foremost, we have the relying party supporting applications. These are your duos, your RSAs, your Octas, the management interfaces for those applications. So anyone who does any kind of multi-factor authentication management knows that there's actually a lot of really important and valuable settings that you can configure, exceptions, et cetera, uh, on your, say, duo management page, right? This doesn't even integrate directly with ADFS. It's not on the ADFS server. It's just the duo app. Uh, second is the identity provider, so ADFS, uh, policies and exceptions. There is some control, as you can see from the screenshot here, uh, that the ADFS manager has in terms of what entities require multi-factor authentication, what kind of multi-factor authentication is going to be supported. Um, these are important pieces as well that we have to take a look at. And then, of course, last but not least, the relying party adapters, specifically multi-factor authentication adapters. Um, now, for the relying party specific pieces, we've already covered that material pretty in depth uh, at a talk we gave in DerbyCon. So we're not going to cover that here, but I do suggest you read it because there are a lot of common mistakes and misassumptions that are made about the security of these kind of management portals that are exploited, um, ex exploitable. Uh, now, talking about the IDP side, talk about adapters. So, uh, what is an authentication adapter for your identity provider? Basically, it's just a piece of code, a DLL, that implements the necessary methods to interface with ADFS's claims processing pipeline. So there's a list of the methods that are required. Pretty straightforward. You can suspect what they're uh, there to do. And so each of these DLLs is actually registered in the GAC. So that's the Global Assembly Cache. Uh, this is basically a place where we can define uh, signed and strongly named pieces of code that are going to be shared by several applications. So we don't have to worry about like DLL hell problems. Basically, it's a safe way to structure it so that you know consistently where to go find the code you need. Um, Interestingly enough, despite being signed, uh, this doesn't enforce any kind of integrity check. You can replace these DLLs, and we'll talk about uh, different reasons to potentially do that as an attacker. Vendor adapters uh, have to support all of the functions above, but they add in their own code to do their processing. So if you're doing a multi-factor authentication adapter, you actually have to set the code to con you know, connect to your API, determine whether or not this user is a registered device, you know, what requirements are there. Um, do they support pin, push, call, right? That all happens on the relying party side. So there are several different routes that you can take when you're thinking about this. One, which is very simple, uh, that we won't talk about, is just register a new adapter. So add support for your own custom adapter. You can define the code there and process the claims yourself. Or uh, more interestingly, we can actually adjust existing adapters to preserve the functionality that's in place. So here's a simple walkthrough of, you know, Let's talk about Duo, for example. So we know that there's a Duo uh, adapter installed on ADFS. So what do we do? We pull up uh, Proc Explorer. We search for anything that has a handle to our uh, adapter DLL. Um, you can see it highlighted there. There's a file and a DLL load for that adapter for the Microsoft Identity Server .serverhost.exe executable. This is the service executable for Active Directory Federated Services. So we go to that DLL. We pull up our trusty DN spy because it will allow us to read and edit the code relatively simply. And we start to learn the flow of the authentication, right? So uh, authentication adapters are structured very clearly that make it relatively easy to understand. They ha usually have a begin, uh, begin authentication method and a try, try end authentication method. And by comparing those two, you can kind of understand the flow of what's happening between uh, the start and stop points. So in this particular example, again, this is the duo authentication, uh, begin authentication method. Um, I decided to edit it. Um, I added a little exception here that said, if the username contains uh, dbeanstock, 
I'm going to manually register a fail open exception and pass it on and return it and basically skip all of the second factor verification code. So this does not rely on fail open being set to true because this is the entity that determines and loads that setting from the registry. So I'm manually changing it in the claim and passing it along and it processes it and if D Beanstalk tries to log in, he's gonna get skipped for multi-factor authentication. So that's pretty neat, right? Easy way to uh, avoid multi-factor authentication. You can get really creative. You can add IP source exceptions. So only from my IPs do I wanna skip multi-factor authentication for everyone. Um, time limitations. Uh, you can even cross uh, reference different users that aren't the one that are authenticating. So here's an interesting agnostic example. Uh, this is basically saying if someone tries to log in with the user account containing beep beep I'm a Jeep, then I want to run PowerShell. This is, you can replace that with literally anything. Backdoors, code to dump say important cryptographic signing materials and relay it to the user in an HTTP response, whatever your imagination might want. Why is this effective? Well, because that sign in page is usually exposed via sort of Office 365, et cetera, um, and we can trigger it remotely. So we, contribute, we can trigger code execution on the ADFS server remotely after we've installed this backdoor. So here you can see a simple example, tried to log in as beep beep, I'm a Jeep. Note, this account does not actually exist, um, and it kicks the PowerShell.exe process off underneath the identity server executable. <coughs> Yeah, so in this case, it's, it's basically a web shell that we've just created. But instead of being just on you know, some random Tomcat server out there, doesn't, we don't really care about, we now have a web, a web shell on a system that is basically equivalent to a domain controller, which we'll get at later. Yep. So there's a lot of interesting methods that are implemented that I recommend people who are uh, interested in looking at the different DLLs um, to go through. Here's an interesting one. So ADFS does have a uh, utility that's not enabled by default. Um, that is externally accessible that allows you to change user, allow users to change their own password. So it's the standard old password, new password, new password again. Um, now you can utilize the method that supports that in any piece of code that's on that ADFS system and potentially say change user passwords to maintain access to a certain account. Again, whatever your mind can think up, you can probably do it within uh, editing the DLLs here on the ADFS server. So, very simple process, kill, suspend the service, basically release the handle, uh, replace the DLL, restart it. Now, uh, there's a lot of different adapters out there, so you basically have to just read the, read the code to understand the flow, um, but all of them in the end can be subverted because at the end of the day, as Doug said, ADFS is the final word on authentication. <laughs> if ADFS says that you are allowed to access something, it does not matter what other identity provider says, <laughs> you can just get access. Um, now, these techniques can also be used dynamically. So for example, you could patch the DLLs in memory if you wanted to. Um, it's a more stealthy way to do it, but there are some drawbacks. In large environments, ADFS is usually farmed, so you'd have to install memory patches on every ADF, ADFS server if you wanted to consistently trigger that exception. Um, also, if the system has to restart or get patched, then you have to have some sort of persistence mechanism that reinstalls uh, the, the shim in memory. So there are some trade-offs, but the technique still applies here. So that said, here's direct attacks on ADFS where you can go and play around and muck about with the code, but there's still another level of abstraction that's a little more interesting that Doug will talk about. Thank you. So when I first started looking into this, I really got interested because of my existing research in Office 365 and, and how many organizations were using ADFS as the authentication gateway to that. So I started reading up on uh, ADFS, and I found this really nice quote by Microsoft, um, which basically sums up the, the rest of the talk. And it says, the token signing certificate is considered the bedrock of security in ADFS. If someone were to get a hold of this certificate, they could easily impersonate your ADFS server. That makes sense. We are ADFS experts. We know that the token signing certificate digitally signs our security tokens and that our relying parties, Office 365, Dropbox, all they do is verify that digital signature. So these certificates are stored in the ADFS server service accounts certificate store. You could very simply use Mimikatz to export the certificate. Um, but when I was thinking about this talk, I realized this wouldn't make a very good conclusion to a talk, just use Mimikatz. So I decided to go deeper and see if we actually can do away with Mimikatz <laughs> in this case. 
So looking at the components, we have the Windows internal database, also known as the WID. This is a relational database that's intended to be used only by Microsoft products. So products like WSUS use the WID. Um, I'm not sure. ADFS uses it. A couple of other ones. It's MS SQL Lite. Uh, it's only accessible locally on the system, and it's accessible over this funky named pipe. Luckily for us, though, if we're local on the server, we can still use SQL Management Studio to connect to this WID and execute queries just as we would against a normal MS SQL database. And this is the default option for ADFS, to use the WID. You can use a standalone MS SQL server, but that introduces more complexity, more risks. It also allows you to use some interesting features of ADFS that you can't use with the WID. Um, but from at least my anecdotal experience, most client organizations are just using the default WID. So how do we access the WID? We, I already mentioned that you need to be local on the server. And you actually have to be the ADFS service account. In my case, SVC underscore ADFS. Um, the SA account is disabled. You couldn't even access this database if you were a domain admin. You need to be the ADFS service account in order to access it. So looking around at the different tables, and there are many, I found the identity server policy service setting table. It's a table with a single row. And the, the column that is of interest to us is a column that contains an XML document with all sorts of configuration information that ADFS needs to start up. One of them that caught my eye was the signing token XML tag. Um, it has a couple of different child, element, child elements. One of them is uh, this thing here, which is just a certificate fingerprint. And it matched up to the fingerprint of the ADFS signing certificate in the certificate store. So I know I was on the right track. Um, we also have the raw certificate, which is just the public component. And then we have this interesting thing called encrypted PFX, which is a Base64 encoded string that, from the title, stands to reason is a PFX file, so a PKCS12 archive format, that it has been encrypted somehow. So I started thinking about how could this be encrypted, DPAPI, some sort of encrypt, uh, symmetric encryption. I wasn't really sure. But looking through that XML document, I saw another interesting element called DKM settings. And it caught my eye because I had no idea what DKM meant, and also because I could see a lot of kind of Active Directory kind of stuff. So it caught my eye. Quick Google search uh, returned some results, among them a nice Microsoft research article about DKM, a distributed key management system with a cryptographically verified code base. DKM implements a new data protection API. Huh, data protection API. Maybe that is what is being used to encrypt the certificate. So looking in AD Explorer, we can find it here along this little path. And I can see that in addition to the sort of normal privileged groups that I would expect to have access to some sort of important crypto material, I can also see that my ADFS service account has read-write control of this uh, object, which is of the type contact. So not a user, but a contact. So again, probably on the right track, but I needed to go further. We needed to start looking at the actual code. So all of the ADFS service is just written in .NET, so we can very easily inspect it in DNSpy. Very useful. I have no idea how IDA works, so this saved me. Um, and we see load certificate collection. Pretty easy to understand what that function is going to do. And the first thing it's going to try is to load the certificate from the user store. This makes sense. It's just easy, right? We're using built-in Windows features. But if for some reason that fails, it's going to start looking at the encrypted PFX uh, blob from the configuration database. It's going to base64 decode it, and it's going to pass it to this little unprotect method. The unprotect method is from the DKM data protector class. OK, so I'm probably on the right track still with my DKM thing. It's going to call some other unprotect methods. Eventually, we're going to get to an object of the class DKM base. And this is where the magic happens. I can see my unprotect method, and I've got a lot of different things. There's a call to decode protected blob. So some sort of decoding is being done. I'm getting a key length. I am reading my DKM key. Um, OK, it looks like there's actually some key derivation here, so some more fun crypto time. And then finally, we have an authenticated decrypt call. So that's probably where, finally, I have a usable signing certificate. So unpacking that a little bit, we have our first function called decode protected blob. It turns out the encrypted PFX blob from the configuration database is not just ciphertext of the certificate. It's actually a binary blob that contains a bunch of ASN1 encoded, DR encoded ASN1 types. And they're all the types that 
ADFS needs in order to actually decrypt our ciphertext. So we have things like the encryption initialization vector, the nonce, uh, different object identifiers for the actual algorithms being used, uh, the ciphertext, obviously, and then a MAC value that's going to be used to validate the uh, integrity of the ciphertext itself. We're also doing some key derivation. So the key derivation here is HMAC SHA-256, which is a standard key derivation function um, defined by NIST SP800-108. So we're taking the DKM key from Active Directory as input. We're putting it through our key derivation algorithm, and we're getting out of it an AES a symmetric key as well as a SHA-256 HMAC key. Um, and this is pretty simple. Thankfully, the, the function name tells us that we're following the NIST standard exactly. Um, it's close to the standard, not exactly to the standard. I had to do some little tweaking in, in Python. Um, I'm not a cryptographer, so I cannot tell you if this does or does not change like the integrity of the key derivation. I don't think it does, um, but it did require a slight modification. So I have my AES encryption key. I have my 16-byte initialization vector from uh, the blob. And then I just use the standard Windows crypto library to actually decrypt my ciphertext and get a usable signing certificate. And the nice thing about this is that the signing certificate is valid for one year, which means I get to be an ADFS server for a whole year. So um, I really like this meme, uh, except this time I decided to become an ADFS server instead of a domain controller. Um, to sum it all up, I'm reading an encrypted PFX blob from the configuration database. I'm pulling out some ASN1 types and the ciphertext. I'm going to read a DKM key from Active Directory. That DKM key is then used to derive an AES symmetric key. Finally, I can decrypt my ciphertext into a usable PKCS12 object. And finally, I've become an ADFS server. I can actually sign my own security tokens. Um, so we talked about MFA. And we're all, maybe some of us are thinking, oh, but I have MFA, so I'm, I'm OK, right? You can create the tokens, but there's still, there's still MFA. MFA is, you know, it's a silver bullet for security. Well, the issue is that ADFS actually controls what they call strong authentication. Strong authentication is any additional factor. It can be M, uh, MFA, it can be certificates, it could be a blood oath. Whatever you want, ADFS is actually controlling it. So if we can issue our own security tokens, then we can just say, yeah, I don't care about MFA, actually. I'm just going to ignore it. Also, the relying parties, so Office 365, Dropbox, Zendesk, they actually have no idea what these strong authentication requirements are. The only thing they care about, the only thing they live to do is receive a security token, verify its digital signature, and give someone access. So we just can throw MFA out the window if we can create our own security tokens. Right, and that, that distinction is important because when someone installs multi-factor authentication, they think that there's some integral piece or information that that service has that authentication can't ha happen without. But with ADFS, uh, Duo may as well get removed from the entire chain because we don't need any of their information. We're telling Duo, don't worry, guys, we have this, right? So that applies to all of anything that gets protected by multi-factor multi -factor authentication, all your cloud resources, your email, mm -hmm. all of this applies. Yeah, and that's because the bedrock of ADFS security is the signing certificate. Once you possess it, you are now ADFS. So how can we actually leverage this? How are we actually going to weaponize this um, as operators? <laughs> as Red Teamers. Um, we're releasing today two tools that will be available on uh, GitHub immediately after the talk. Uh, the first is called ADFS Dump. So this is a .NET assembly. It's designed to be run on the ADFS server itself. And as we already mentioned, you need to be the SVC, sorry, you must be the ADFS service account in order to access the configuration database. This tool assumes you're using the Windows internal database, although it's very easy to change it to use an external database. You run it on the server, it's going to dump all sorts of information that you need to become an ADFS server. The encrypted PFX, the DKM group key, the information about the relying parties, and very importantly, the issuance rules for those relying parties, so we know what information we need to take and put into our security tokens that we're creating. Our second tool is ADFS Spoof, also available on, on GitHub. It's going to be a Python program that's designed to be offline, run offline, so run on your own attacker system. It does two main things. It's going to decrypt an encrypted PFX blob given a DKM key, so it'll give you a usable uh, signing certificate. It can also take just a plain certificate file that you dumped using Mimikatz or other tools if you wanted. And the second thing it's going to do is it's going to generate signed SAML tokens that you can then send to any of the relying parties configured 
as any user. Um, and going, thinking back to SAML and the standards, why this is uh, really possible is because we know that the SAML tokens need to look a specific way. They need to follow the standard. And we have the issuance rules, which actually tell us the different attributes, the different assertions that we need to put into our security token. So from those issuance rules, we transform them into XML assertions. We put them into our token, and we sign it. Um, because I'm a nice guy, I'm releasing three templates with this tool. The first is a template for Office 365. The second is a template for Dropbox. And the third is a generic SAML 2.0 template. So with the last template, you should be able to create uh, signing, signed security tokens for any relying party that uses SAML 2.0. Okay. So I don't trust the demo gods. I just do videos instead. So we can see I'm in Cobalt Strike. I've compromised an ADFS server, and I'm running as the ADFS service account. So I can now begin running my uh, compromise tools. So I run ADFS dump using execute assembly. I have the DKM key from Active Directory. I have the encrypted PFX blob. It's going to tell me that it's ADFS 2016, which is important. There's some distinctions between versions. And now it's dumped out information about the relying parties. So Office 365. And this gives me all of the information I would need to create a security token template if there wasn't already one that existed. So the uh, signing algorithm, the endpoint that I need to send the token to, um, the hash type. So most of them use RSA SHA-256, though there are older ones that use RSA SHA-1. And then the important part is the issuance rules. So Office 365, the rules are extremely complex. I don't know why. Um, but most relying parties, like Dropbox, for example, Zendesk, their rules are simple. They maybe have two or three rules. And it's very easy for us to see, OK, this rule translates to this XML tag. This rule translates to this XML tag. It's very easy to form your templates. Um, and we have an example of a rule here. We can see we're querying AD for the user's user principal name, which is what Office 365 likes to use a lot. And then we're going to output it as a claim of the type uh, UPN. So I've got all my information. I can now use ADFS spoof. I'm using Office 365, and the two different assertions Office 365 really needs at the end of the day is the user principal name and the user's object GUID, which we can get from Active Directory as a simple query. I'm also giving it the encrypted PFX blob and the DKM key. So I hit go. It gives me this nice garbage, which is basically just the token, URL encoded, so I can simply copy and paste it somewhere. I'm going to use burp just because it's simple. We can see I'm sending the token to Office 365's consumer endpoint, login.microsoftonline.com. I just paste in the token, click go. Now I'm going to copy this using BERT magic and put it into an incognito window so I don't have any existing sessions. Uh, BERT is really great. Just hit go. You can see that it's consumed the token. I'm robin at docorp.co. And it's very nicely logged me in to Office 365. Uh, as our user, uh, Robin. And I didn't know the user's password. I bypassed all the multi-factor requirements that I had, and I've now accessed this user's email um, just because I decided to become an ADFS server. Right. So um, as part of this, as security practitioners, we have to ask ourselves, why does this matter? Um, so just as a quick question, how many people who've been uh, involved in incident response have ever heard of remediation activity directly resetting material on the ADFS server as part of a compromise? Nice. No hands are up in this room. That either means attackers have never compromised the ADFS server, or we've never thought to actually look there for evidence of compromise. So that is what we're here for. We're not going to just drop this tool out there without giving some guidelines. First and foremost, we cannot say this enough, you have to secure your privileged user access. The ADFS server is essentially a domain controller. You have to treat it like that. What does that mean? You have to limit privileged access. You have to use multi-factor authenticated jump boxes. You have to read and take very detailed notes as you watch Sean Metcalf's uh, detailed talk on how to securely administer your domain because he tells you how you should be protecting your tier zero devices, but not everyone knows that the ADFS server is a tier zero device. Second, enhanced auditing. If you're responsible for an ADFS server, you should go turn on success and failure audit logs, forward them to your SIM, enable audit application generated events, 
on your ADFS <coughs> via GPL. Why? The more data you have, the higher likelihood that you can trace evidence of compromise back to an ADFS server, because that is a critical piece. We couldn't imagine a situation where we said, well, we don't have any visibility on our domain controllers, so we're just going to ignore it as part of our response. Make the ADFS service account a GMSA. Uh, generally speaking, managed service accounts are sort of the way of the future. Uh, they help resolve a lot of problems with things like Kerber roasting. Um, it ensures that Active Directory is taking care of all of the nuts and bolts of that account, changing the password, making it highly complex. Use it, uh, love it, embrace it. Um, additionally, for those people who are extremely paranoid, uh, you do have the option to use things like hardware security modules. You can store the cryptographic material for ADFS in the hardware, isolate it further from access from attackers, and raise the bar much higher uh, on becoming an Active Directory federated server, uh, federated services server. Yeah, it's important to note that in this case, uh, ADFS is no longer managing your cryptographic material, right? The default configuration is to, I think they call it Windows Managed Certificates. ADF, Windows takes care of the signing certificate, takes care of the encryption certificate. If you want to forgo all of this, you can just buy a certificate or make your own self-signed certificate and port it into the ADFS management snap-in. And then the, this whole encrypted PFX mess is not going to affect you. Um, but by default, and again, from my experience, most people go with the default, Windows manages the certificates for you, and thus we can do this attack. Right. And that's not to say that simply using your own certificate magically removes the possibility yeah. that someone can spoof it. It just means they have to go after your certificate, and they can't just get the key derivation and signing material directly. Yeah. Um, sec last but not least, while we're at it talking about best practices for ADFS, um, for 2016 and up, you can turn on extranet uh, smart lockout policies, which basically allows you to prevent easy password spraying attacks, um, pretend, prevent them from locking out, identify noisy IP addresses that are you know, throwing a bunch of authentication attempts against your ADFS endpoints. Because as Doug pointed out earlier, these are easy to identify. You know, NTLM authentication is exposed. You can throw a bunch of attempts against it right now, uh, potentially locking out accounts. So uh, something to keep in mind. Talking specifically about incident response. We have to treat identity providers as a core part of the incident response process. They are just like domain controllers. They are just as important. We have to start talking about them from a remediation perspective. So if you have good visibility and you have high confidence that an attacker has targeted your Active Directory Federated Services server, then you can reset the signing key material. Now you're thinking to yourself, there must be a button that you can just press in ADFS that magically resets your material. Doug, does that button exist? Uh, yeah, more or less. Um, you can use, there's a pretty simple PowerShell command to reset the signing certificate. But the, the important part is that you are dealing with a trust relationship, right? You have a private key that you're using to si digitally sign something. You also have a relying party that has a public key somewhere that it's actually using to verify that, OK, this is signed <coughs> with the digital signature with the private key that I'm expecting, right? This prevents me from just making my own key pair, signing it, and sending it to Office 365. So if you reset the signing key, you then need to go to all of your relying parties, Office 365, Dropbox, BombGar, and say, hey, I've got a new private key, public key pair. Here it is. You should trust this one going forward. So why we say carefully is because you have to make sure that you actually do that so you don't break uh, access to email for all of your users. Right, because that would be really bad. Um, second, uh, have a baseline. No, understand the configurations that you want to be set up. You can use PowerShell to quickly compare your expected configurations to your current configuration. Understand what the state that you want ADFS to be in so that you can more quickly identify when it's in a state that you did not expect. Finally, verify your core adapters are intact. You can easily go and edit the core DLLs that under you know, support the entire process from the Microsoft side. Um, you could even do this for just .NET system yeah. DLLs anyway, right? You should always have some form of file integrity when you're dealing with high value targets. Because as we demonstrated, you can set up essentially a remote web shell on your ADFS server. And if you have no visibility into that, well, uh, remediation isn't going to be very successful. One point before we wrap is um, looking forward and sort of wrapping up, this talk focused on attacks against ADFS itself. So, um, 
relying, uh, adapters multi, with multi-factor and editing the code, how we can actually become an ADFS server. So for you know, some period of a year, I can create my own SAML tokens from anywhere. Um, ADFS is a huge, huge piece of software. It's got a lot of components. Um, looking forward to additional features and attacks that we'll probably start talking about. ADFS, when you are internal, it accepts Kerberos authentication. So thinking forward, this may be an interesting way to get a SAML token just by having a Kerberos ticket, right? So maybe another way of bypassing multi-factor, bypassing the need to have a user's password. There might be a way that we can just send a Kerberos ticket to ADFS and access a relying party. Yep. Um, and last but not least, if you have good logs, um, this is a technique that uh, I haven't had the chance to use in the field, but it's an idea where you can uh, line up your Active Directory logs and your relying party logs, so like your duo application logs, and attempt to verify that there is a one-to-one -one relationship. If Doug is impersonating your ADFS and signing into Office 365, they will have an authentication log, but the Active Directory federated <coughs> server on your premises will not have evidence that you specifically requested signing a signed SAML token from them. Right? So if you have those detailed logs, that is another option of identifying if there's something funky going on with your server. Um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, at the very end here, um, while the tool sort of release for this is new, um, this is not necessarily new material, especially for attackers out there. Um, there was a blog post by CyberArk several years ago that talked about you know, the idea of a golden SAML. Um, and they released some key signing code, but not the code to actually get the material to sign everything for you. Um, so this is an extension of that work, hopefully uh, coupled with the talk about ADF, ADFS uh, as an architecture, you guys feel much better informed. And as attackers and defenders can rely on this information to help secure your clients and make the world a safer place. Thank you.